Kirtana and Eric to mute because it does end up creating a lot of uh, white noise and static. Thank you. Um, but definitely we will unmute when we get to the discussion part. Uh, uh, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for turning up at these strange hours of your biorhythms. Um, really appreciate your participating in this experiment, which is the first time that in terms of time zones, uh, we've connected Australia, India, and the United States. Um, I, I'm the one who's benefited from this exchange. <laughs> it's a very reasonable uh, one, one o'clock in the afternoon for me. Um, thank you all for, for suffering and putting up with this. Uh, it's an experiment, um, but you are very, very uh, so welcome. And it's such a great thing to see you wonderful people here to uh, be with my wonderful guests, Kirtana and Eric. Um, this is session 13 of Unrehearsed Futures season two. And our topics uh, organizing these sessions in season two have been planetarity, possibility, and plurality. So we convene once a week on Thursdays to talk about things that we care about in the world of theater uh, practice and pedagogy and performance. And um, it, we are, it's a collaboration between Drama School Mumbai um, and uh, Jehan started this uh, in the middle of the pandemic in 2020, or at the very beginning of the pandemic, and then involved me at Embodied Poetics, which is uh, my link with Norman Taylor. We are both pedagogic directors of Embodied Poetics. And uh, now we're collaborating with the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, our two colleagues, Mgeni and Wenya, may show up. It is extremely early in the morning for them. Um, but at any rate, I would like to uh, welcome you all and my guests to this discussion of theater and community, which um, uh, we devised together. Um, I think it's, uh, from my point of view, it's relevant because the pandemic I think has really changed what we consider to be community. I myself have experienced a kind of amazing upsurge in community as I'm somebody who, who um, has traveled a lot and lived in a lot of different places. And I have found uh, the pandemic uh, with all of its challenges and, 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 and tragedies to be um, also a chance to feel my, my planetarity. This is a, a phrase by um, Gayatri Spivak, which is a very powerful uh, antidote to globalism. So planetarity is the way in which we find our interconnections and our connections to each other. And I have found that Unrehearsed Futures has been a really powerful vehicle for that for me. And I'm uh, talking to Kirtana and Eric about how uh, community, um, how they practice with their communities, with their theater companies, um, and uh, how this might be changing what the pandemic might have done to that and what's, you know, basically what's going down. Um, so I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, Kirtana is in uh, Bangalore, India, outskirts of, right? Uh, and uh, works at a, at, a, at a theater, I call it a theater farm, but it's, it's really a farm, Infinite Souls Theater really or farm. That. It's, it's a farm. It's, it's a, a theater, theater farm. Yeah. Farm. Yeah. Yeah. Farm um, theater. We grow theater. <laughs> marvelous. Marvelous. Uh, can we start? We'll start with you, Kirtana, and then uh, uh, move to Eric. Kirtana, can you introduce yourself? Uh, your, your bio is going to be in the chat. So all of the sort of long uh, introduction, but what specifically around the topic of com community, could you introduce yourself and your work? Okay, thank you, Amy. Thanks for inviting me to this and good morning to everyone. Good morning from, I, um, from outside Bangalore, way outside Bangalore. I'm Keertana Kumar and um, I'm a theater practitioner, like I'm assuming all of you. So what has been, Amy actually said, why don't you talk about community in the introduction? So what I'd like to share with you is that the pandemic actually affected an enormous change in my life because I moved completely out of an urban, urban circumstance to living on my farm and to farming and trying to find new engagements with theater through the, through the land. And one of the, uh, the prime motivators for this was actually the migrant crisis in India where migrant labor found themselves suddenly walking across the country trying to get back home. So in, uh, th this was the direct connection and it was also a practical reason for moving back because the people, the farmers who worked on our land also wanted to return to their home. So this has been a really enormous um, change in the way I think about community and also the way I think about art making and theater making. So that's it, that's me. Wonderful, 
Great. And um, and uh, also you're collaborating with the drama school Mumbai. Oh, yeah. Um, and right now, yeah, today, is- as we speak, very importantly, as we speak, I have a giant JCB and Earth Mover and tractors outside my window. So if you can hear the noise, because Jehan's students from drama school Mumbai from the advanced course will be living with me for three months here at the farm in a COVID bubble and we'll be doing embodied work. So all our embodied work will take place here. And that's really exciting to have actors back at the farm because we've been farming sweet potatoes and tomatoes and lentils. And now we hope to farm some actors. So. Marvelous, marvelous. Thank you, Kirtana. Um, and, and now I introduce to you uh, Eric Ting, a very old a friend of mine uh, from way back when we were uh, in graduate school together. And Eric is the artistic director of Cal Shakes. Eric, can I ask you to introduce yourself and your work with your company and, and the community? Sure. Uh, thanks, Amy. Uh, it's kind of awesome being here. I, uh, like, I, I feel like I'm in the presence of at least three teachers. Um, Fred, Daniel, and, and Amy, I think of you as a teacher too, so it's um, kind of really trippy. <laughs> um, so looking forward to the conversation. But um, I am, uh, I'm, I'm Eric, I'm he and pronouns. I'm actually zooming in from, we have practice here at my theater. So um, uh, I'm zooming in from uh, unceded Osage Massawomack lands, um, also known as the heart of Appalachia, uh, West Virginia. And um, I'm actually here because my mother, I just try to be very transparent about things these days. So my mother passed away back in February and we are, um, we are throwing her celebration of life on the 3rd of July um, to immediately be followed by my daughter's sixth birthday on the 4th of July to immediately be followed by our packing up this house and getting it ready to sell. Um, so I find myself in this extraordinary moment of transition uh, this is the house that I grew up in. My mother lived in it for 40, 43 years. Um, and so I'm like going through these things and finding just sort of like, you know, I always think of objects as um, memory triggers. And so um, if you can imagine surrounding yourself <laughs> in your boyhood home and all the different objects and all the different memories that are triggered by it, it's really something, something special. Um, I'm the artistic director of California Shakespeare Theater, uh, which is located in the Bay Area on the East Bay in Orinda, um, California, which is unceded uh, Chichenya speaking Ohlone lands. And um, we're a Shakespeare theater. We've been in Shakespeare theater since 1974. Um, and, uh, but we've been a Shakespeare theater in the last 10 years, really committed to um, sort of an anti-racist journey as an organization. Um, and uh, I would say that the big, the big turn for us has been when I took over back in 2016, um, you know, we, we put a lot of resources and energy into seeing the world through the art that we made. And I think what's happened over the last year um, in a very kind of, I think, profound way has been a shift towards seeing the art through the world. Um, and, uh, and how we think about our relationship to it, not as, not as art at the center of things, but as sort of our community at the center of things and art as simply one of several tools that we have available to us um, to, I think what we talk about a lot these days is um, the resilient communities and what does it mean to be resilient in that way? So glad to be here. Thank you for opening that space, both of you. Um, and and I and thank you also for, uh, for the reminder. I mean, I am on unceded Palawa land, and I really appreciate that you have put it in those terms. I've never heard those terms before, and I think that's really accurate. Unceded um, Palawa land in Tasmania. Um, uh, and I'm. Uh, I'd like to pick up on this thread of uh, you've both mentioned how you're, in some sense, what I make of it is working to. Um, give voice to or create a, a space for um, people who have who have somehow been silenced or who have been um, put put into the margins. I mean, you mentioned your work uh, as an anti-racist stance, and Kirtana, you mentioned creating a space for migrant workers. I just really, I mean, these are such disparate issues, but I, I really I see them as connected, and I'm just really would love to ask you to 
to say more about that? If, if, that's, if that's a theme, could you say more about it? What theater can do in, in that space? Um, you can unmute, unmute yourself, Kirtana. Um, sure. So to begin with, when I was working in an urban circumstance, so I was working in Bangalore, my audience was a very, um, now when I think about it, it's quite a defined audience because it's an audience who has access to theater. It's an audience with a certain degree of literacy. It's an audience who many different things which come from a certain elitism. I found that the minute I moved out and also the pandemic, the pandemic, like for you, Amy, I found the pandemic was, it just released a lot of stuff and it's been a really, really amazing time outside of all the tragedy. It's been really a time to rethink and to find new uh, ways of engagement. But most recently, what happened was this, it's really, um, I, I didn't make a concerted effort to change my community. I did not, though our work at Little Jasmine has always been, uh, you know, coming from the feminist credo. So it's always been intersectional. We've always, we've all, our work has always been on the, um, on the, on the crosshairs of caste and gender, sexuality largely. But most recently, what I found was this, Working on the farm is a lady called Nagama. And Nagama comes from a, 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 the Kuruba, a shepherd community, from a Kuruba community. And Nagama is non-literate. Nagama is about 10 years younger than me. It just happened that Nagama and I began a series of, of communications during the pandemic because I was in a different, I was in Germany and she was here at the farm. And we started, but she uses a smartphone. So she has access to the visual medium and she uses a smartphone. So we started a series of communications over WhatsApp and Instagram and on smartphones. And the first thing, the, the, the onset of this thing was that I was trying to explain snow. I said, there's this white stuff falling outside and it's really cold. And, and she was like, but what is it? It looks like white rain. Is it light? What is it? And this started off a series of communications. And this has led to now, a, it's a multi-platform, it's a thing called Nagama's Letters that I'm still in the uh, process of assembling. But it's, it's a, it's a, it includes a documentary performance, but it includes Nagama who's non-literate and me, and we're two women, and we're two women who still communicate outside of the politically correct boundaries of, of or, or trying to find open spaces within intersectionality where there lies tenderness. And there lies, and I'm really, because you mentioned Spivak, Amy, there's a really, you know, Spivak for me is also problematic. The last time I mentioned this thing about planetarity, because it's sort of uh, exclusive and it excludes people who don't read, for example. But I found that she has a really beautiful quote about otherness, you know, and I use it in Nagama's letters, that the one thing that is anti-global is when we can, when we develop an ethics of otherness that is not cannibalistic. So with globalism, it was a cannibalistic ethics of otherness. But now if we can transfer onto each other, and if we assume, rightly so, that in understanding or in sharing, we're always transferring. If we, if we understand that and say, yeah, that's okay, we do, we do transfer, but we can start, begin the uh, journey of empathy or the journey of compassion with the new ethics of otherness. So I find this really profound and this has really directed a lot of the new work, including what you know within the Hour of God, which was, uh, it was an oral theater project and really depended only on the voices of actors and nothing more. So it was down to just essence. So I would say, um, yeah, I mean, that's it. That with Nagama's letters, I sort of, I'm trying to find something uh, about this, about this mm. quality. That's amazing. I've, I've put that in the chat. By the way, um, anybody, uh, pl feel free to use the chat as a place for reflections and comments and, re and even questions or so forth. And then after half an hour, we'll open up uh, as a general discussion and people can unmute. Um, uh, that's a, a, a really brilliant, this ethics of otherness that is not cannibalistic. Wow. Um, uh, Eric, it, does that spark ideas for you? What Kirtana just said. I'm really curious about how you. <laughs> yeah, your, I mean, I'm practice. still unpacking it. Yeah. It's great. No, <laughs> you know, I mean, um, I mean, I think, I think, I think at least, at least part of what I hear, right, is um, 
so we're a Shakespeare theater. So like, I think like, and, and when we think about the role that Shakespeare has played um, sort of is just th throughout the history of colonization and, uh, you know, in this country, the, the manner within which Shakespeare was often used as a tool for erasing language and culture um, from indigenous peoples, like it was, that was part of, that was one of the things that was taught in these boarding schools across this country. Um, you know, we, we, if you, if you run a Shakespeare theater, if you do work around Shakespeare, you're often centering Shakespeare and you're sort of, and I think a lot of the conversation that we've been having um, and this is where this conversation of vulnerable communities begins to come in, right? Is sort of like, is, is just what is what is actually the practice of decentering? Like, what does it what does it actually require and demand? Um, and what are you even trying? So you have to name what you're decentering first of all, and then and then how do you decenter in such a way that you're not actually disappearing, right? And so we use the image of a circle frequently at Cal Shakes, and um, and a friend of mine who's a colleague of ours and a member of our artist circle talks about this specifically as what's interesting about the shape of a circle and specifically a circle is held by human beings. So you think about that regular acting exercise, you know, whenever like I, you know, like when you, you, you go up into a room and you tell everybody to circle up and then there's always that moment when everybody looks around very awkwardly at how poorly the circle is made. But like this idea though, right? That the shape of the circle is being held by a collective of human beings and that a center is actually a center. There's nothing there but a sense of a center is being energetically held by each person and you're trying to shape that circle actively it's a process there's no line that you're meeting right there's no like no one has drawn that circle out for you to 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 to, to stand at you're trying to find that space and that process that that kind of energy that that space is the space that we're interested in being and the only space the only way to be in that space right is um, to find yourself in a way is, is in a way to kind of find a way to release yourself into the whole. Um, because inevitably what makes circles so hard to make is because people have a point of view about what the circle is and where they should be standing. And, and it's that friction, I think, that makes it sometimes very challenging. And so are you saying that Shakespeare is kind of the sense of the center? So people kind of, uh, they're, it, it's serving as a kind of catalyst for a sense of, what, what, what role does Shakespeare play? Well, in I, mean, I mean, Shakespeare is like a cultural monument, right? Like, so we talk like, mm -hmm. so there's been a lot of conversation about monuments in this country, right? And when we talk about cultural monuments, when you think about what are the cultural monuments in this country, there are few as large as Shakespeare and, and, and across all English speaking, kinds of cultures and countries, right? And so this idea of a cultural monument and the sort of weight of that and the legacy of that um, is just um, is just the thing that I think, I think part of like part of this is about the practice of naming things, right? So like even even this idea of planetarity as a response to global globalization is like it's all about names on some level, right? It's like we get to a point where certain lang like language becomes stale. Because what starts to happen is everyone starts to everyone starts to sort of begin to follow it. So like like equity, diversity, and inclusion is, a, is EDI is a phrase that we use here, and that's been now replaced by anti-racism, in part because EDI became a catchphrase that everyone was suddenly signing on to. And the more people signed on to it, the more superficial their relationship to it was, the more diluted it became. And so language becomes a method for um, for shifting power, shifting the center of power, right? And so. That, that's often why, right, we see um, the, the shifting in language coming from what is, I think, historically, what I would describe as sort of peripheral communities, right? It's sort of, you know, the center is going to be the language that is best known um, and most strongly held. But when you start, like, when you start to, like, when you start to change the language, that's coming from, that's coming from the outside. Um, and the really powerful choices shift the center. Wow, that's really profound. I mean, <clears throat> okay. Uh, so you're saying, uh, one of the things that you seem to be saying is that you have to shift language to sort of keep people in a process of centering, that as soon as they become too comfortable with a monumental center, then the process of creating the center seems to break down. Is there something about like yeah. that monument? I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just like, I mean, this is, I will, I will center Shakespeare for a moment because that was the beauty of Shakespeare, right? Shakespeare is making up language. He's making up language in a way that actually forces you to listen, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is the same case here. It's sort of like, if you feel as a human being 
that you are un imbalanced because of the language that is being used, that's actually a good thing. To me, that's a good thing, right? Like that's actually, that's, that's a state of learning. A state of learning requires a state of not knowing, right? So you have to not know something to learn it. And so that, 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 that edge that you're riding there, which we, we often refer to as the learning edge, right? This is, these are our learning edges, right? Which is where we begin to feel uncomfortable. Um, and where you begin to feel uncomfortable is actually the space that you wanna reside. And that that's like, that's actually the space of change. Okay, this is great. So this, uh, it's gonna, I'm, I feel that we're gonna have a very rich conversation with everybody when we open up the room. Um, I'm gonna throw another ping pong in, which is um, this, uh, the fact that I perceive, okay, so this is, again, I'm having to sort of generalize to, to, to sort of uh, launch something, um, that, that there's a increasing political polarization uh, perhaps in both, you know, in India and the U.S. I mean, uh, is is this some um, so in in absorbing the uh, sort of bringing in the migrant workers, Kirtana, have you been addressing you know politics per se, or is that something you let be you know in the background, or how how do we deal with this sort of increasingly rhetorical and divided political field? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Amy, and this is one that we're having with our dramaturg all the time. So my dramaturg is um, Julia Dina Hesse, who who's German. And um, it's a really complicated one because the perspectives, global perspectives are so divided to begin with. Let's just look at an issue of food and politics, for example, right? So now Julia has really strong uh, ecologically driven ideas about food and politics. Now here, when I live, I live in a shepherding community and what is interesting is the question you asked us about who are your communities? I'd love to address that in a bit. But yeah. in a shepherding community, which is a, also an impoverished community, I'm not impoverished, like not bottom line, but it's a poorer community. For them, there's no question of uh, the, this idea of um, being vegan or ethically being vegetarian. It's not, it does not play out at all. So it's a very, even dramaturgy itself is having to really rethink its ideas, right? There are no, there are no solid, um, you, there are no absolute uh, ideas about how to go forward on this, which I find like what Eric said about being uncertain, which I find absolutely the gift of the pandemic, that the, the idea that the global South should sit back and listen to um, the stream of consciousness stuff arriving to us from, from the North or from the West has been demolished because it doesn't hold good. So right now, even with Nagama's letters, for example, Nagama, for instance, will slaughter a goat and eat every part of the goat, everything, the liver, the gizzard, the kidney, the hooves, the, everything, it'll all be used. For me, this is a really ethical lifestyle. It is a very beautiful way to live. And it's a really, it's a connected way to, to live. How do you explain this to somebody in the global North who's making an ethical choice to not eat meat? because it's an anti-farm uh, factory farming practice, you know? So it like places us in these very delicate points of negotiation. So um, yeah, and about, about whether one directly addresses politics, this really I find has to do with the audience because if I'm working to an audience of young, young people, oftentimes it's better to just raise um, questions and leave it to them to figure things out or to work their way through it. But sometimes I find that it's, it's, it's good to put it out there. So it really, really depends on the audience that I'm working with. And that's, um, it, you, yeah, so that brings us back to communities and who are your communities. And I'd be so interested to know from Eric whether he's found that his community has markedly changed because mine has uh, through the pandemic. I've moved so far away from an urban, sealed from a bubble audience. I find that the pandemic has opened it up and my audience is across the world or my audience is in Germany or my audience is my tiny village or my, or my community is my young students and I worry about their mental health and what we do for them. So um, it has changed enormously. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I'm just, I, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'll, go, I'll, I'll reply to Jehan after that because this, Idea no, of please, please, please reply. It's quite all right. I was thinking about that, Jehan, this morning, because it seems like previous, prior to the pandemic, we sold tickets and we had a show in a proscenium or non-proscenium style, whatever, in a beyond the proscenium style space. 
and people bought tickets and people came to the show and this was the audience we had. Now working with Zoom and working with online platforms, it's brought a kind of intimacy into the, I mean, it's really strange to say because without physical contact, how do we have intimacy, et cetera. But I see into your bedroom or I see your bookshelf or I see what you've chosen to hang on your walls. And there's a theatricality in that. There's an arrangement and there's a set of choices that me as a creator is dealing with as well. So it, I don't know, I'm not sure whether it's defined versus non-defined, but it's made it different. I'm still figuring it out, but it's definitely changed it. And right now, because we're still just, what is it? Uh, less than two years into, into these lockdowns and into the pandemic, I'm still discovering it. And I'm still discovering what are the ways to create risk, to create questions and to create interactivity. Yeah. Uh, okay, wonderful. Uh, Eric, did you wanna uh, go back to Kirtana's question? I mean, yeah, I mean, only only in so far as I, uh, I appreciate the question and I think I don't have an answer yet. Like, I think um, um, I, I'd like to say that, I mean, I, I absolutely our audiences have changed since since we canceled our season. So like, so the pandemic, the pandemic hit in the US in in was April um, of 2020. And it was shortly after we held our benefit fundraiser. So we threw the last big party in the Bay Area um, before the shutdown happened. And then we canceled, we ended up canceling uh, our season a week later. So very, very quickly we made that decision because it just seemed very clear to us at the time. Um, so, so we lost the audience that we normally have, right? We lost the audience that we sort of spend, spend time with in person. Um, and the other thing that happened though was we did a pretty radical shift in terms of our programming um, and rather than, rather than continue to produce art in the way that we had been and doing so in some kind of virtual format, um, we really began to sort of hold conversations not unlike these to kind of lean into, um, lean into the sort of very challenging discourse that we found ourselves a part of and, the, the, and, and asking very similar questions um, and making that a resource for audiences. But I think, you know, we're, I guess the reason I said I don't know is because I think we're we're coming out of it now, and so I don't know. I don't think that I will say like for many of our theaters, this is what I know, and this is maybe just secondhand knowledge. But in terms of when I've been speaking with my colleagues, um, many theaters have found virtual programming to be largely unsatisfying in terms of outreach. Like it hasn't it hasn't achieved that kind of global connection that I think some some artists have been able to sort of find through this platform. Um, and that's, I think, because so many of our theaters are, you know, number one, tied to their specific local communities. And then number two, there's just, there's just a glut of entertainment options. And, um, and I don't know that, I don't know that, I don't know, I certainly don't, I can speak for Cal Shakes, I don't, I certainly don't think Cal Shakes was able, um, over this last year, amidst everything else, was able to sort of find that inroad. And, um, and that's fine, I think that's okay, because I think we're, we're all shifting now into a hybrid model. The virtual platform, this space will continue to be a part of the programming model. Um, but I think, as you said, Kirtana, um, the, you know, I think of, I, I always say about the theater, the theater is the practice of being in each other's company. And, um, and the thing about that is that it's sort of like, I don't know, I just, it's funny, it's funny. I, 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 <laughs> I love, I'm a total tech geek. Like I love, I love, I'm, and also an introvert for, for the record, I'm a, such an introvert. And anyone who's ever met me in the last 30 years is gonna tell me that I'm a liar, but I am a total introvert. And, um, but I'm an introvert with like extroverted tendencies. So, but this last year completely sent me back decades. And so I'm like, I'm like all, all over again. I'm like, I really don't ever wanna leave my house. I'm happy to sit in front of a screen, hang out with my daughter, read books to her, do you know, and like, like just, just like I live my private life. And so, so much of what I think this next, these next few months are going to be for many of us, um, certainly in my community, is it's going to be um, relearning. Oh God, I, I so. I so understand what Eric is saying. And what's, what's even crazier is because we live on the farm, we've really become like a tiny 
little unit that's yeah complete bubble so yeah it's going to be a huge but also the hybrid model has is for me personally it's it's really exciting and with young people who've been on it who've been on social media and have been on the internet for so many years and who know so many tricks i'm just learning so much because i find the theater lab youth creating things with them for example last year during the summer because they couldn't do um they couldn't do a summer camp here at the farm and they wanted to have summer camp we created a interactive zoom piece called um the case of the missing ring where they pre record they on zoom they performed this first part and then they had an interaction with a live audience and then they played the third part which was the result but it was so fun doing it with them because they were really into using this tiny screen with lights and with uh, miniature props and really you like using it so creatively and even with the edits and using all the filters like zoom now has all these lovely filters they can use so it, it was really fun and using twitch to create theater so i learned a lot just from teenagers you know just from watching how they use tech and it was yeah it a programming is a whole new uh, rich it's a whole new rich journey because we rethink and maybe that's a good thing because we were so stuck i don't know not eric i'm not saying cal shakes because already you're working with such a marginalized community and the work is already so so rich but i feel that the urban model in india was really stuck in a proscenium space and with a proscenium philosophy however experimental whatever and it's also it, it's also to me okay again this is an india india situation to me i am dead tired of us depending on our heritage i think this is bullshit and i'm just like really like we've got to say like fuck this shit it all happened so many years back let's cope with our colonization and let's say we really uh, uh you know at like the bottom of the barrel and start from there rather than harking back constantly to this amazing heritage i don't it's it's to me i think it's become a habit it's not it's not a life and it's just an easy habit so i feel we need to find new practices and this is a great way to find new practices that don't remain in the old elitist uh, proscenium mold so I, I'm delighted that you've mentioned this habit because it seems to me that also what you've identified are habitual audiences, and 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 I'm I, I'm very curious about how habitual audiences interact with some of the experiments that you're doing, right? Because that seems to be part of what happens is when we're talking about serving multiple communities, one of our communities is a is a habituated audience and can be very upset or shocked or distressed when. When we start changing the game, so I'm very curious about. But this is in the moment of inflection point where we start to really open it up so people can can uh, speak and so forth, unmute. And um, so I'll, we'll continue uh, dialoguing. It's a, Zoom is sometimes a little bit challenging like this, but um, I'm going to go into the chat and I'm going to read out um, uh, the Sogo. You you uh, you uh, commented a while back about the cannibalism that occurs within. Communities of struggle. This is a really interesting notion. Are you still with that? Do you want to unmute and talk about that, or, or, um, because uh, I, I don't see you there. But are you, are you there, Lasogo? Maybe not. Um. Hi, I'm here. Oh, hi, um, hi, hi, hi. I, I, I don't see. You. Hi, hi. Sorry, I'm in Cape Town, so it's yeah. like just in the middle of the night. It's not yeah. a fun time, but here we are. Oh, thank you for turning up. <laughs> thank um, you. Nice to be here. Um, I, I was just thinking about how community, um, at least as I conceive of it um, from, from a South African standpoint, from a South African point of view, and maybe from a global South point of view, maybe I could push it that far, but I, I choose not to. I'll speak for, for, for a more localized point of view. Is like the community's um, uh, old, old, a sense of community often derives from the idea of struggle. Um, and I think that this this idea of otherness being cannibalistic often then manifests itself within these these communities that that come about as a response to struggle, right? And so these these uh, feminist spaces then become like spaces of uh, oppression Olympics, or these uh, blackness spaces then become these spaces of who's the best black um, or, or whatever the case might be because there is a particular kind of um, uh, addiction to struggle 
um, and, I, and I think it speaks back uh, quite productively to Kirtana's point about, about a marriage to heritage or to pseudo ideas around a romantic, euphoric, beautiful, wonderful pre-colonial time uh, that none of us actually know much about. And, <laughs> you know, that marriage to that struggle perhaps is worth um, starting to think about evolving past. Um, I don't know. Yeah, but th those are the ideas that were floating around in my head when I made that comment. Yeah, terrific. Thank it's, it is fascinating the way it rejoins what you were saying, Kirtana. Um, by the way, if you want to raise your hand, then I then I can call, it's, it might make it more easy if you want to say something. Just find the emoji, raise your hand, and then uh, I can uh, call you. Call call you, um, uh, Kirtana or Eric? Do you want to do you want to say uh, anything in response to what Lasoga just said, or or um, ideas that might have sparked from that? Yeah. Well. I think what Lasoga said about the addiction to oppression or the addiction to struggle, it's really, it's really interesting. And we could unpack that further if anyone cares, because especially during the pandemic, there's been so much virtual signal, uh, virtual signaling as well, right? Even in, in the making of art. So it's, um, I don't know, I'm thinking about that. It's interesting. Um, uh, one of the conversations that we have a lot internally at our organization um, sort of, we've been, we've been in the process of an account, like we've been going through an accountability process this last year is how I talk about it a lot. And part of that is sort of about, you know, naming just what it means to be in the business of making theater, which is sort of a very capitalist thing, right? And, and the, the business of making theater is about making something new and then following that up with something new and then following that up with something new. And that what starts to happen is it just kind of reinforces this very transactional, very transactional relationship, right? Where it's sort of like, and here's the next big thing, and here's the next big thing, and here's the next big thing. What falls away in all of that is any kind of real relationship. And so like, so the other, and I'm saying that, and then I'm gonna put something else right next to that. And the thing that I put right next to that, right, is, um, you know, we, uh, because we, uh, we describe our organization as a legacy white institution. I describe it as a legacy white institution, which is a different phrase from historically white or predominantly white. And I use that phrase it, uh, uh, very intentionally, right? Which is that a lot of our cultural arts institutions in this country, in the US wouldn't exist, but for, right? The legacy of um, accumulated wealth that is a direct result of the original land theft and labor theft that this nation was built upon. And so like, so that's just, that's just the truth, right? Like, I think it's hard, it's hard to, it's hard to deny that. It's hard to deny the sources of, of, of revenue that have supported, that supported the birth of many of these organizations and the continued life of these organizations. So, so you have to name that, you have to kind of come at that with a, a, a space of humility, but it's also like, so hard, right? Because like, I, the other thing that I talk about a lot is because I'm Chinese American. So I'm Chinese American. I was born in this country, first generation. My parents were immigrants from mainland China. And, um, and you know, for me, uh, I talk a lot about um, white adjacency, right? And I think like, and I, I, I often find myself in spaces where I feel the need to name that because a lot of my work is about advocating for you know, uh, uh, other communities that have historically had less privilege than perhaps I've experienced in my life. And the interesting challenge of this, right? So this is like this whole notion of oppression Olympics, this whole notion of, I, I think this is what you mean by cannibalism, but please, please forgive me if I'm wrong or correct me if I'm wrong, but like this, this notion, right? That we begin to, um, you know, we begin to eat ourselves from the inside out because of this, which is like scarcity, right? That's like the whole scarcity mentality. When you have nothing, you know, you just, you just, you just feed from what's there and you don't see what else is possible. And so this, this idea of um, naming white adjacency uh, in a way that isn't about apologizing yourself to invisibility is like the, the challenge. Like it's a challenge that I feel like every day, right? Which is, I need to be able to show up with humility, but not in an absent way, because I see that happening all the time right now. Like I see that happening in so many spaces from so many different directions, right? Where 
sort of like the impulse is to step aside. The impulse is to give way to um, the communities that are sort of um, that whose struggle is now kind of taking center stage. And the, but the process of stepping aside often involves stepping completely away. And so then allyship disappears, right? And then this whole sense of community disappears. And to me, that's tied to a kind of fundamental transactional relationship that we have in this country, right? And that if we could find our way back to deep relationship, if we could find ourselves back to a space where actually, and I think this is some, I saw a question uh, that you had asked uh, Jehan earlier, right? If we can find our way back to a space where, you know, we're not, we are not, um, we're not connecting with people because of the project that we're doing, but we are in connection with people dis in, despite the projects that we are doing, right? What does it mean to actually be in that kind of, like the so, sort of relationship that we create in a theater, what, is, what would it mean to be in that relationship with each other all the time? And what does it take to hold that and sustain that? I think I lost my train of thought there. I'm sorry, it's 11 o'clock. No, no, that was- Not that, as no, late no. as it is. In, it was it was very good it was very good uh, just to clarify eric i think the the cannibalism thing um it, because of the capital because of the anti-global or the anti-globalistic or the capitalist framework within she frame within which uh spivak writes about it has to do with the sort of the shopping around the shopping for culture or the shopping for um food or whatever the which is which is with a lack of connectedness it just it's a, it's transactional it's just that i can avail yeah. of this that or the other but it's no more it's not emotional yeah i mean this is an interesting conversation about like like i mean I, this is this is the catchphrase of the moment apparently in this country but but when we when you talk about critical race theory right like part of the conversation is specifically about this idea that whiteness is not like that's not an that, that's not an identity that's a kind of political like that's a that's a structure that's been created and established but like it's not culture like there's no white culture there's no white culture right there's like there's british culture there's there's do you know there's like there's there's but there's nothing that like you would define as the culture of whiteness and so whiteness in and of itself is kind of like appropriating left and right all over the place um and and yeah i'm actually yes Mm -hmm. um, it, can I pick up on a, uh, uh, so Elizabeth, you've picked up on something uh, that Eric said, and, and I had picked up on it uh, as well as an intriguing. Can you unmute and, and talk about connecting with people despite the project is the empty space in the center? That was a question mark, but it sounds like you're making a proposal yes. there. That's interesting. Yes. Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> hi. That's so exciting being here again. Um, Yes, Eric, you, you, you said that you lost the train of thought, but it was the moment when I understood more things of what you said. Um, this connection with the people, despite the project, despite what's happening there, you know, it's like this, the project is not the, the objective, it's like the pretext of being there. So yeah. I, I wonder if that is what you call the empty space. So there is yeah. something there that is empty, but is is gathering us around. Um, I don't know if it is empty or because it's totally full of something. So that's that's my question. It's interesting, right? Because um, when I was coming up in my training, uh, theater was often described as church. You know, I've, I've shared that phrase. I've, I've said as much in my time. Um, my experience of theater today is in many ways the exact opposite of church, right? Because theater is not, theater has not been one of those places that people return to every week to be in community with a group of people that they come to know, you know, whose children they see grow up in front of their eyes you know, who share the same song and share the same language and share the same sort of prayers. Like that is not the theater that I know. And that is not the theater that I think exists in the world. Like, I don't, like, I just don't, I just, I mean, at some point we have to all be really kind of honest with ourselves about like what theater is. 
And I don't know that theater is church because theater, because like, and, I, and that's through the specific lens, right? Of church as being a space that nurtures community and connection and relationship. And it's not that theater can't do it. It's just that that has not been my experience of it, right? And now we can say that that's in part because I'm a person of color, for instance, you know, and like, and, and theater has largely been a white space. Um, and so because of that, I've never felt invited into that kind of relationship. I don't know theater from the point of view of a white audience member or a white artist. Right, I only know theater through my, my own experience of it. But like my experience of it is such that, um, you know, we don't, we are not given that space. And theater is process, I, I hear you, Jehan. Yes, absolutely. But like in this country, process lasts eight weeks, four weeks if you don't include the performances. And then that show goes away and you start all over again with new people, right? And if you're lucky, you work with the same people a few times a year, if you're lucky, but you're not actually working with them. I just need to say something back to that, which is yeah, even, even that where you're saying theater process lasts four weeks or eight weeks, we're still tying it down to the need to make that product. You're still yes. tying it. We're still tying it down to the project, and I think we need to unshackle ourselves from that as well and go back to this thing of how do you have the ongoing, continued engagement throughout. And that takes us into the realm of what has also been boxed in another space, which is theater and applied theater or, you know, things like that. And it's not, it's all part of a continuum. So yep. I just, I mean, I know we're preaching to the choir here, but I just think that we have to, we have to also just, even when we go to the next thing, well, okay, theater is a process, but when we don't, we don't then make the mistake of putting ourselves back into a cul-de-sac by saying, but my process is only lasting four weeks because then as soon as you say that, we yeah. tied it back to the project. Can I, can I, oh, sorry. Do you, can I just ask really quickly, do you all know this two loops theory, Cortana Institute, the, uh, Bur, not Cortana, the Burkana, Burkana Institute, sorry, Cortana. Um, the Burkana Institute, um, two, it's, it's the two loops theory. There's a video presentation of it. If you, if you Google it, T-W-O-L-O-O-P-S. It's a really fascinating theory of change. Um, and, uh, and basically what they say in this, like in this presentation on this video, if you watch it, it's essentially, this is a, a, a woman from the Burkana Institute giving a presentation around the petroleum industry, fossil fuel industry, right? And what she's saying is the, the theory of change around the two loops is that there is a primary there's a, there's a kind of primary industry and then there's an alternative industry. And the way that a primary industry is replaced by an alternative industry happens in this kind of shape of two loops. And the idea is that when you see a primary industry kind of like a, in ascendancy, right? There's a certain moment in time as that, as that primary industry is in ascendancy, right before it reaches its apex, right? Where you begin to see an introduction of alternative industries, like something starts to happen just as this primary industry is reaching what will ultimately be its kind of like top point. And in this case, it's like uh, renewable energy, right? And so, and then what starts to happen, and while that's happening, while the primary industry is still reaching the top and the alternative, the alternate, alternative energy is coming in, right? The alternative energy is struggling like hell. Like it's like, it's failing left and right because there simply aren't the resources for it because the resources are being eaten up by the fossil fuel industry in this case. But there's a certain moment in time when the primary industry hits its apex. And everybody realizes, oh shit, this is not the way to go. This is like, this is all, this is all gonna start to fail. And you start to see it failing and you start to see climate change. You start to see all these things that are starting to happen, right? And that starts to come down. And as it's coming down, all of a sudden that alternative industry is like, oh yes, take, give, 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 give. And it, it, it starts to shoot up. And, and as it's shooting up and the other one is coming down, right? There is this phase. This is the thing that I wanna talk about with this, with this two looser. There is this period of time which I love, and I think the reason I came to this was because this was also with my mom, right? It's, it's a hospice period for the industry. Like someone in all of these other things that everybody's doing, someone has to be responsible for like hospice care for that, that primary industry that is now in decline, right? In order to let it go in a way that allows this new thing to take its place. And I would argue that that's where we are right now 
in, at least in the US, in terms of the industry of theater. And I think what you're saying, Jehan, is the art of theater. And I am absolutely with you on that, right? The art of theater is never gonna go away, but the industry of theater, as it's been shaped by capitalism, by the kind of withdrawal of federal funds in this country, by the NEA for, by like, you know, and it's as it's become over time a tool of uh, like a political tool, you know, that industry is failing. Sorry, I didn't mean to go off, but what's, it's a really what's good the one going, what, What's the one coming up? Sorry, <laughs> I mean, uh, the, that one's failing and what's the one that's coming up? The alternative one is? That's the question. That is the question. Uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, I have, I have ideas. We are. I have ideas. <laughs> um, uh, I have to, Fred, you've been raising your hands and uh, Falguni has been telling me you've been raising your hands. Sorry, I didn't notice. Uh, could you, could you uh, unmute yourself and speak? Sure. Thanks, Amy. I couldn't find how to raise my hand, but I know how to raise my hand. Um, uh, I'm speaking not as the choir, as um, Jehan mentioned, uh, but but as a dead white man. And uh, in, in some ways, I am already dead, not because I'm older than uh, all of you, but or most of you, perhaps. But but because I'm concerned with this issue of what's the meaning of life and death and um, what it is to experience death before you actually, Eric, have to mourn somebody or go through the process of dying. And uh, I believe uh, the theater attracted me in my halcyon days because it grappled with such questions in a very deep way sometimes. And certainly the Greeks and Shakespeare and uh, who knows what primitive, uh, you know, progenitors uh, made a kind of ritual or theater that, that took us to those places. And um, I, although I'm sympathetic to what Kirtana said about, you know, getting rid of the a uh, fucking legacy of of uh, indigenous or you know our Indian theater, but I've been, you know, not never having been to India, I've been deeply touched by not only the traditions of of Indian theater but also of Indian philosophy, and uh, the way they encounter such deep, deep, deep questions. So uh, I guess my question is uh, for each of our um, speakers is uh, because the, the you know, I, I, I'm still teaching in academia and I've been alarmed by how purely political the discourse has become. In other words, anything that has aesthetic concerns or that has existential concerns or that has deep psychological or, or uh, you know, metaphysical concerns is, is completely suspect, considered retrograde, considered, uh, you know, antithetical to the need to make, make uh, all sorts of political actions, which I consider quite right, quite righteous, I'm totally in support of. At the same time, that's not what has appealed to me about theater. So uh, I've seen a lot of Eric's productions and they're transcendent. There, you know, he's a great artist and a profound artist. So uh, I'm not criticizing your work, but I am criticizing or at least questioning the level of discourse, which I find um, from a deeply uh, human level, superficial. It's not politically superficial. I mean, I just had dinner with a couple of Trotskyites last night for, for Christ's sake, you know, I mean, talk about discourse, but, um, you know, I, I do question that. And I, I've sent you letters about Brecht even, Eric, which although you didn't respond, I, I loved your Brecht performance, but I even questioned some of the um, adoration of Brechtian politics and contemporary theater and the thought that that's what theater is all about. So anyway, I open it up to any kind of response. You know, I'm throwing down the gauntlet. I'm, I'm totally in, I'm down, I'm dying to respond. But Eric, you go first since. Oh, please, Cortana. 
Okay, so um, I mean, so many things in what you said, Fred. Thank you so much for that provocation. Number one, um, okay, first about the life and death to, to uh, thing. Yeah, so that's been on my mind as well, which actually, uh, which is why I think the In the Hour of God link is somewhere here. Maybe you'd be interested, Fred. Because I think maybe you'd be interested. But when Jehan was speaking and when Eric was speaking earlier, I was really thinking that the moment that is on us is to rethink up theater pedagogies and what it is we offer students and what to move away from the skills model into a model that is much more philosophical and uh, to reply Fred to what you were saying um, to clarify actually it's not that I loathe Indian philosophy it's not I loathe the practice of deadness I loathe the practice of habituality where you know we're, we're not thinking something through but we're just doing it because that's our glorious past. And I really, there are so many glorious pasts. So I want to know why we're harking back to a glorious past that is a Hindu glorious past or a Gupta glorious past or whatever glorious past that is. So I think that, and especially because we're in India today, we're really living in, in times of fear of this huge right-wing uprising. It behooves us to really consider what past and what tradition and to also act in an alive, for me, theater is also being alive. Uh, aesthetics is very, very, a very high concern, but it's also being alive to the moment and to being critical of the moment and seeing what's going on. So, um, and the other thing is a lot, of, a lot of material, a lot of content that to the West is beautiful and moving and touching comes with a very, very feudal and very casteist diktat, which doesn't allow women in which doesn't allow lower castes in, which is very caste ridden. The th if we want to be modern, and if we want to go ahead in a modern way, it behooves us to think about these things. So what appears aesthetic to somebody who's not living in the culture may not include the beating to death of somebody. Or may, I mean, for instance, let me also share with you that theater practice, even contemporary theater practice, if, if a practitioner of a director is working with a traditional form, for example, or is working with form that you might have heard of, which is like, say, let's look at Tangta, which comes from Manipur and which to the West is very familiar. It's a didactic feudal form. It's a form which involves a director standing in the theater with a stick, no less, and beating the ground and beating the legs of the, of the actors. Now, the thing is this, we make choices. Do we wish to go forward in this way? You know, and what is it? Do we want to uh, create museums of feudalism because they're pretty? So it's, it's a kind of, it's like choices we have to work with constantly. So while I love, I really love, and there's so much about Indian philosophy. I, I really hope all of you look at in the hour of God, because for me, that was really a pandemic creation. It was a creation for the pandemic. And it's based on Sri Aurobindo's philosophy of life and death. So it's not that I'm averse. But I need to be alive as a creative practitioner. I need to be alive to my immediate circumstance and to the communities. And my communities are shifting so often. So that's the only thing. That's what I offer in response. Eric, do you wanna... that, that, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Eric, did you, you were going to respond too, right? Daniel, I, I was, up. but Daniel has his hand up. Oh, sorry, Daniel. I, well, I just wanted to respond to Kirtana with a question, actually, because I'm very involved in the intersection of pedagogy and students, because that's the life I live. And when you say, when you when you pose the question, what do we share with the student? What, do, what, what in fact do we ask the student to work on? I've spent a life trying not to, and say this to my students, not to fuck with their poet. I try to give them delivery systems so that their poet can be as articulate and as loud or as soft as it needs to be. And my job as a teacher, I've tried, literally, I've tried to, to not 
tell them what their poet needs to say, because I feel like I, that's terribly pretentious of me to think that I could, I mean, I know what my poet needs to say, and I spent a lifetime creating work that, in fact, some of it with Fred, yelling my poet's desires as, as an instructor or as a as the guy with the flashlight in the room, I don't even tell people anymore that I'm a teacher. I tell people I'm in the room with a flashlight, I focus it on something and we all look at it and we discuss what we see. And then we discuss the, the delivery systems that we could bring an audience to actually contemplate that thing, be it a, the intersection of the ceiling and the wall, a perpendicular. And, and then we talk about that. And it has led me, it, and, and, and I think it has led my students to talk about what's in the room, which is terribly topical. It is the community that is in the room. It is. And so my, my question, because I, I would love to work with you, uh, because I want to be on a farm too. I, 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 and, and the whole idea of farming students, huh? It's an open invitation. I would love that too, really, for each of I you. Can, I can make it happen. My, stu my, my school will send me anywhere. They're I'll amazing. Cook, you know, do come. I'll cook, you. I'll cook you. I'll bake you bread. Absolutely. Well, we're going to talk. Okay. Uh, but, but the question is, what, what is our responsibility with the student? But uh, Daniel, I feel exactly as you do, that it is to shine that torch on that thing and to not fuck with the poet. Absolutely. I, my, my question about modern pedagogies has to do with the old skills delivery method, right? Which is you do body work, you do this, you do that, you do that. But what about, um, okay, so this is it. The, the place I'm coming from is this. I, I lost a student to suicide less than a month ago. And I just, this has really made me think that, you know, while we do all the stuff about skills and about text and all of this, are we also saying as theater practitioners, are we also giving people a wonderful way to live and to get past the darkness? You know, because there's that as well. How much within our pedagogy, how much time do we, do we care to spend on that? So that's, but besides that, I agree with you on everything you say, because yeah, I'm totally in sync with that. Well, I, I guess think, I might I just, ask a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's it, that's all. Um, I guess the question that I might ask is like, and I, I don't think of myself as a teacher. So um, this is uh, just that's so with a grain of salt, of course. But I guess my question is what makes us think that we have the tools to offer these students a path through that, right? Like, and I think like, do you know, I don't like, this is the thing, like, I mean, Daniel, Fred, you both, I mean, I named this at the very beginning and both of you are, um, have been extraordinary influences in my, in my path and my journey without question. And, um, and Fred, I appreciated the nice things that you said. And I see your hand, Jehan. Um, and I just want to say, Fred, like, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how to answer the question that you've posed without naming just what I believe to be a truth is that your lived experience is very different from my lived experience. And what you think of as universal and what you think of as like, like what you are interested in, what you are passionate about does not need to be what I am passionate about. And the fact that you sometimes come at me with a kind of like critique, right? It's always, a, there's a compliment and there's a critique of like, why did you make that choice? Because I feel like it makes it less, is actually saying to me that my lived experience is less than yours. And I know that's not what you're saying, but that is what it comes off as being. And that's kind of like this, the, the challenge that we find ourselves in right now is simply that like, you know, I, like there's just, you know, I think it's like this whole question of how do we make space for different lived experiences? Because for so long, and this is, this, is a, this is a risk of pedagogy because I have been students of teachers who have taught this way, which is that there's only one way. And that if you follow this way, your world will be opened to you, right? And nothing has pissed me off more 
right? And I've seen the rigidity of that. And I've seen the fragility of that, right? And so like, and to me, it's like, I appreciate Daniel, what you're saying about like, let's like, how can I give you tools that allow you to actually take that lived experience and shape it? And just like, like that's all, like, that's kind of what like, and to me, that's the, that's the future of the theater. That's this new theater, that's this new thing, right? The old thing is this like idea that there are like masters. And I use that word intentionally, right? That there are masters that somehow we are all sort of meant to learn from. And it, it's not, and I think I just, I'm just posing this kind of like this challenge to this idea that there's number one, anything even like universal, this idea of universal like also angers me, right? Because universal almost always, almost always reduces an experience of someone. Yeah, might I, might I chirp in? Can, can I respond? Yeah, please, please. Oh, well, I, I prefaced what I said by saying I was a dead white male. So you, you don't have to worry of what a dead person <laughs> says to you. Uh, and, and I sincerely meant that I admire your work, but um, I, I've, I do feel that for myself and for others that to not be responsive and open to critiques uh, hinders our capacity for insight and growth. So uh, I'm sorry if there's some element of critique what I'm saying, but um, of course uh, you, you and everyone, whether they're, you know, whatever their origins are, has a different experience from me. I've experienced anti-Semitism and had to run for my life when I was a kid by from gangs of people who wanted to kill me for killing Jesus. So, uh, you know, I have some level of empathy, but no deep understanding of what it means to be other. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I'm, I'm I understand I'm privileged, but I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about when I, and I never use the word universal. I was talking, uh, I think I said existential, which is a pretty shoddy word also. And I said merely political. I'm all for politics. I'm all for making political activity for through theater. The Greeks did it, Shakespeare did it. It should be done. Of course, it, it's necessary. But the merely political is something I've always had a problem with. I don't feel you do that, Eric, but I think the discourse, the contemporary discourse reduces the notion of theater to something which is akin to that. It becomes a form of, um, of politics. And that's, that's certainly one very important aspect of it, but not the only one. And I might add uh, that, Years ago, I, I they asked me to write recommendations for the MacArthur Fellowship. And I, I wrote some, including Daniel, actually. Sorry you didn't get one, buddy. But, um, you know, and I surely would have written one for you, Eric, if I knew you back then. But uh, the second year, they said, your recommendations were great. Could you write a new bunch of them? And I said, I quoted William Blake. I said, you know, we're led to believe a lie when we see not through the eye that's born, uh, well, whatever. William Blake said that we really, our perception changes absolutely everything. And he was a very political kind of poet guy. But um, I think art has the capacity of changing or at least uh, working with people's level of perception, which is not the same thing as political discourse or intellectual discussion. It actually goes to the roots of the way we experience the world through our minds, our bodies, and our thoughts, and dare I say, our spirits. So that's something of what I was saying, you know, yes. not to say you're defunct in that. 
Okay, this is a marvelous dialogue. I'm delighted that as curator, I have to raise my hand. Um, uh, I'm going to send us in the last five minutes back to a comment that came a lot a long time ago, uh, because I would really like it if uh, Manjari had a chance to uh, uh, speak and ask her question if she still wants to. Um, Manjari, are you still interested in asking about what theater practices might reduce the cannibalism in the audience? That's an interesting understanding, if you want to unpack that in the last five minutes. Are you still there, Manjari? I, yes, I am. Um, so it would be interesting to, Jihan sort of already responded to my question, but it would be interesting to hear um, of what um, the speakers have to say in uh, connection to their own practice and how this plays out for them and what um, sort of, you know, uh, things that, um, that they keep in mind while making their work and while presenting their work so that it does not become a sort of a consumer and product kind of relationship between um, their work and the audience. And uh, how, um, basically what I've already written, how, how do they deal with mm -hmm. this kind of uh, experience of um, uh, theater yeah. of watching and experiencing, yeah. Wonderful, thanks. Um, we might just have time for one of you to respond. Would would uh, either of you, Kirtana or Eric, like to respond to Manjari? Eric, I think Eric. Uh, <laughs> are you sure? Um, um, you know, uh, Kirtana mentioned the museum earlier and um, another thing that I say a lot is that we are a theater and not a museum. And what we mean by that is that, you know, our practice is not the preservation of past practices. It's, um, it's something more immediate. And it's a it's sort of like, and, you know, so often people say that they want to go to the theater to escape the world. And what we say is we go to the theater to let the world in. And to me, that is often the most important thing. So you know, the theater that I make 10 years from now may be very different from the theater that I'm making now because 10 years from now will be very different from now. And to the extent that we are able to make choices um, to create frames for the work and the discourse that allows the conversation of this moment to be alive in the art, um, to me, that's the most important thing. And, and how you do that is like kind of this, this is, is manifold. So for, for our part, um, we're often in, in conversation with um, members of communities whose experience directly intersects with the work a year, two years, three years before the work happens on our stage. So we're working to understand um, how the play uh, it comes from you know, their point of view. Uh, and to me, that's like so important, right? And so like, and it's important that the artists that are participating in the work have, have accessibility to the experiences of the characters that they're putting on that stage. It's important that, um, that the audience, right? Be filled with people for whom that story actually speaks to because the alternative is an audience who doesn't understand that story. And historically, there have been artistic choices that like direct the story to that audience. So what does it mean when you actually have an audience for whom that story is written for? Um, but those are, I mean, that's, that's the simple, simple answer to that question. This is, this is absolutely marvelous. Kirtana, um, what I'm going to say is, uh, you, you don't know this, but we have an after party, um, uh, which begins now, <laughs> basically. Um, so there's, there's not a hard stop. It would just stop recording, and then we keep talking, and anybody you know, uh, can, can keep talking. So um, I'm going to officially I close. Recording. 